Hello, thank you for being with us today. And joining us in this round table. So this is about using composites to improve sustainability in composites manufacturing. And we have a wonderful uh, panel of experts, and we really hope to uh, be able to get questions from you and have a discussion. So this roundtable is presented by Composites World, and we're very grateful to JEC for uh, allowing us this opportunity. The reason uh, that we wanted to do this uh, was because um, as senior editor, my name is Ginger Gardner, as senior editor, I've been writing about composites and sensors for the last few years. And I was just so amazed at these new technologies that we have and what it can do for us. And so um, after writing all these articles that you can see here, we started pulling all of this information together, and we've created a knowledge center on our website. So you can go to compositesworld.com, scroll down, you'll see the knowledge center, and you'll see sensors, and everything is there. So we've put all the articles, all the videos, and we tried to make it to where um, people could find more information, and we're adding to that all the time. We have new sensors coming up that we're going to be writing about. So I'm going to give you a very short introduction introduce all of our panelists, and then we're going to open the floor for questions. And we really want you to ask questions. There's no stupid question. Every question is a good question. And we want to have um, these experts be able to help us all learn more. Why do we want to use sensors? So one of the first things that I learned was that um, we're actually able to cut cycle time by as much as 50%. So um, Synthesites is one of the companies that is on this panel today. And their dielectric sensors um, have already demonstrated this, that they can cut the cycle time of RTM6 and a liquid molding process by 50%. We have seen uh, RTM6, that process, uh, also cut by other kinds of sensors, heat flux sensors in an article I wrote about the InnoTool 4.0 project with GKN Fokker and uh, Technic Module Engineering. Um, but uh, that's not restricted to just liquid molding. Synthesites has also proven that with prepreg processing, that they can cut the cycle time. And we can cut cycle time also in other processes, resin mixing, resin degassing, um, injection, polymerization. When we cut all of these cycle times and we start adding that up together, now we start to affect our energy usage. So that statistic of reducing energy by 30% also came from Synthesites um, and one of their latest uh, presentations. But that becomes part of how we gain sustainability. These are the things that are being asked of us now, um, of the industry and of you as parts of uh, manufacturers. One of, the most, uh, one of the other things that's really important about why we would want to use sensors is to gain visibility into the process. So we no longer have a black box of an autoclave or an oven or an RTM tool. We want to be able to see the material state inside of that in situ through the process, whether that's curing or mixing or uh, infiltration, infusion. And we have that ability now to watch during the process and learn. We learn more about our process, how to optimize it, um, how to optimize the materials for that process, how to see defects before they occur, how to prevent the defects. We then use all of that data, so whether that's the TG, uh, watching the TG all the way through, or watching the viscosity all the way through, knowing the temperature all the way through. We use all that data, and we put that then into the digital thread and the digital twin. And you can see an example here from Common Sense, who's also on our panel today, of how what they see going forward, that we'll have a digital twin on a composite pressure vessel where you'll be able to see what the temperature was during the cure, what the strain was during the cure, what happened during the vessel's lifetime. And then we use that data to do better end-of-life cycles as well. And then what do we do at the end? We can enable now closed loop control. We have adaptive presses. We have smart tools. We have smart injection systems. We have the ability now, and that's been proven through Synthesites and other companies, to use those data from those sensors to open resin inlets, close them when the infusion's done, adjust the, press, the pressure in the press, adjust the temperature in the mold. We ha we're doing this now. We've demonstrated it. So these are things that, that we need to be doing in the industry. Our first panelist is on the far end, Nikos Pantelelis, if you'll And uh, Nikos is the director of Synthesites. And so what this company has developed is dielectric analysis sensors, DEA sensors, that measure resistivity. So you'll see on the left axis, you can see the resistance in the resin. So you're looking at the material state of the resin. 
And along with the temperature, you then use those data um, to estimate the T sub G viscosity and track that. And they've demonstrated it time and time again. They've proved it versus DSC samples that they can do this very accurately. The system you see at the bottom is at the Dutch Aerospace Center, the Netherlands Aerospace Center, excuse me. Um, and that's a system they've uh, purchased. <clears throat> so you'll see the part in the autoclave. You'll see the part and the tool uh, have sensors. That data comes out into these data acquisition units, the blue and black acquisition units, and then gets fed into the computer for processing. And you see the kind of curves you, you can obtain and watch during the process. And then the cure simulator is at the lower uh, part of the screen here. You have a sample of the material outside of the autoclave, the same as what's inside the autoclave. The data from the autoclave is feeding the temperature cycles, and both are going on the same. And you monitor your cure. Again, this is some of what we can get. We have a dashboard, and you can see we have degree of cure, temperature, viscosity, and all of that can then go into your digital thread, your digital twin. In the bottom, if you look at this cycle time, we have 270 seconds. So that's a, perhaps a legacy uh, time temperature. But we can go lower. And we can even further optimize based on the resistance that we're measuring in situ in real time why would we want to keep curing when it's done? Um, the next speaker is Tuli Potilla. She's the marketing manager for Colloid Tech Oi uh, from Finland. And their technology is Kalo. So they have a probe sensor you can see in the liquid. And then they have a plate sensor, which can be put in a mixed vessel or process line. And at the top, you can see in the green circle, there's the probe. And that's in paint. And you can see that it's measuring the mixing. And it can let you know when there's no further change, it's plateaued out, it's done. You don't need to keep going with it. There's so much data that this technology is geared for. What they're doing is they're using an electromagnetic force, and they're pushing that into the liquid, receiving the symbol, signal back, and measuring um, a variety of parameters, ion viscosity, primitivity, and then six other parameters. And they can fingerprint that liquid. That liquid could be a monomer, a polymer, a resin, an adhesive. They also work with um, distilleries and uh, paint companies. There's a wide range of applications. So this graph shows you what they're able to do. They're looking at the ion viscosity as every single element of that paint is added. And they can tell you what is going on in your process. You're watching your process and what's going on so that you can optimize it. You can benchmark your best process. And then you can watch the process drift away so that you understand what each batch is doing and how to bring that back into what the benchmark process is. Um, and this is a contactless technology. So as long as the container is um, non-conductive, you can read through uh, 5 to 10 centimeters into the liquid based on what you're trying to find and, and what frequency you want to use. You'll see down here what we can do now is we can set a, a specification. Uh, this is the proper A to B mix. And if that liquid is within spec, great. But if it's not, it alarms out. And now you can intervene. And you can change that before you have a bad part. Um, and one of the, the things that I find most interesting is that by gaining this data and doing the, the edge analytics right there, we turn it into actionable data. We give you know what color has been working at is giving you information that you need. And that's one of the things they do in working with customers. You know, what do you need to know um, so that you can make a better decision? Our next speaker is Tom, Thomas Schleck. And Thomas is the group leader for condition monitoring at the Institute of Materials Resource Management at the University of Augsburg. I first came into contact with um, UNA through this project, COSIMO. And FORSEA was involved. A lot of different partners were involved. And what they were trying to demonstrate was the use of sensors. You can see the network at top to um, optimize, to make smart, a process for a demonstration um, electric vehicle battery cover. And the process was thermoplastic RTM. So you inject caprolactam as a monomer, and you in-situ polymerize to come up with a PA6 composite. And they used a lot of different materials, glass and carbon and foam. And they were able to track that injection. They were able to track the polymerization. So if you look at the network, you see the DEA sensors. Those were NETCH. They had Kistler pressure, temperature sensors in the mold. And then they had an ultrasonic sensor that they customized um, to deal with the higher temperatures of the thermoplastic process. And again, what you're able to see, you're able to get um, track what's going on in the process. I think they were able to look at the polymerization time was about four minutes. 
um, they were able to say, yes, that's when we reached the maximum polymerization, the process is done. And then they went even further, they built a lot of models and used AI, and, it, and the goal is to turn this into a smart system, right? So you can see at DLR here, the lab, and you can see the press and the injection system. And now these partners in Augsburg have developed the Augsburg AI production network, and the goal is to, um, they have 6,500, 7,000 square meters of space. The goal is to have companies come in, bring your projects. How would this work for me? How would I use sensors? How would I use AI to make my process better? This gives you an example of some of the work that's already being done by UNA for additive manufacturing and then for machining of composites. You can see the black sensor on the head and that it's able to gather data and then optimize the machining. And then uh, from RV Magnetics, we have um, co-founder and CTO of RV Magnetics, Dr. Radislav Varga. And this technology, I don't know if you can even see it between his fingers, is, is um, a magnetic microwire. And that technology's been out for decades, but it's finally been honed to where it provides a solution. So it's a unique alloy, metal alloy, encapsulated in glass fiber, uh, not glass fiber, but glass. And it's very small, so it can be placed inside the composite. And it can be, again, interrogated remotely, um, up to 10 centimeters. You use um, electromagnetic force, you excite it, you receive the feedback, and you can measure temperature, pressure, and the magnetic uh, state. And what's been done in the US by a company called Avpro, um, who has a magnetic wire, microwire, they have proven with the United States Air Force that you can put this under two inches of carbon and read it fine. It doesn't disturb the part. It doesn't disturb the bond line. They wanted to prove that the bond line saw temperature, and it can stay in the part. And they can interrogate it whenever they want. Um, some of what you can measure is here. You can see the different um, uh, electric current and flow, resin flow, and cure monitoring they've also looked at. They've got demonstrations online now of how the temperature sensing work and how the vibration sensing work. And then um, there's a lot of other capabilities that Dr. Varga can answer and discuss. And then we have uh, Eli Wood, co-founder of Common Sense. And they have a long track record with fiber optic sensors. And we all know about fiber optics and how the data is transmitted through light. What allows it to be a sensor for us are the fiber brag gratings, which you see here, that are etched into the fiber. And then that can help us understand what we have going on with strain. Um, they also pull temperature. And those, you, again, are very tiny. And you can see that in a composite pressure vessel. And what we've also demonstrated through a project called Sucos, and that's on our website. I just put a, sorry, very long blog out about it. But what they did was um, AFP those sensors into a panel, and then they used those sensors to monitor cure and also to monitor what happened in the panel uh, during impact testing afterward. So we have the ability to automatically place sensors now. Um, so what you do with the, the fiber optics, or what Common Sense has demonstrated, is that they can track what's going on um, during filament winding at the layers, what strain is going on, what strain is happening during cure. And then we feed that in, again, like to the digital twin, the digital thread, use it to optimize the processes, optimize the designs. It's not just for filament winding. They've used these sensors in other processes, such as RTM, to look at resin flow, to look at what's going on during cure. Um, and then one of the things with fiber optics that traditionally has been a little bit difficult has been the connection. You have to connect into the fiber optic, and that's new technology that Common Sense has come up with to make this much more practical. And that's what we're seeing across all sensors now. It's evolving to be much more practical so that you, um, the parts manufacturers, you, the material suppliers, it's more easy to use and understand. And that's the end of my introduction. And now I'm going to open up the floor to questions. And hopefully we get a lot of questions, and we can start our discussion with our great panel of experts. Is, does anybody, uh, are they brave enough to be the first? Any questions on how the technologies work, how they might be used? OK, that's fine. I'm going to start off then. Um, to RV Magnetics, Dr. Varga, can you give us an update on your development work with composites and what you have demonstrated already with strain sensing and temperature sensing? OK. Thank you, Ginger, for a nice introduction. Uh, of course, we are working in uh, these sensors over uh, seven years uh, in technical applications. And our idea for, uh, for composite world is to introduce them prior to production and to monitor uh, 
production process uh, during curing. The size of the of the wire is like a human hair, so most probably, if you are not very careful, you have a lot of uh, such a, an objects in the composites already because of workers that losing their hairs. But uh, the advantage of this uh, wire is also that it's, they are small, they are magnetic, they can be uh, detected contactlessly, and you can place more of the sensor, so single sensor for uh, each layer of the, of the composite. So you can monitor not only the temperature, but the distribution of the temperature and distribution of the stress across the section of the composite. Since the price of the, of the wire production price is uh, negligible, you, the wire remains in the composite and they can serve for further production they uh, are able to survive uh, welding, like induction welding, like uh, laser welding. So you can monitor the temperature of the contact during welding of already produced composite. You, and later you can use it for structural health monitoring and for non-destructive testing. Another advantage that the same reading system can read temperature, stress, vibrations and uh, regarding the application, so uh, we work on different projects, starting from production of uh, composite, also for uh, automotive, for uh, replacing different uh, parts, like, uh, like uh, bath for the, for the batteries, for example, wheels, monitor uh, springs, leaf springs, and different construction parts. Apart from automotive and aviation, we also work in, uh, in medical applications. Since the wires are covered by glass, which uh, is made of Pyrex glass, they are biocompatible, so you can introduce on the, onto the surface of different composites you can place inside the, the human body, or you can monitor uh, like uh, different, uh, the temperature and stress of different implants or uh, different prothesis to monitor the distribution of the stress in prothesis and to get uh, insight whether for customization of the prothesis or personalization of uh, prothesis. And, uh, and there are plenty of applications. Typically, this wire does not change mechanical or functional properties of the, of the products you want, to, you want to use. And uh, the lifespan is much longer than lifespan of composite, so you can use it whole lifespan of your product, and uh, you can use it also for predictive maintenance and, and different others. Thank you. You're welcome. Perfect. If you'll stand up, we'll have a mic to you right away. He's coming. <laughs> She's coming. I can borrow your microphone. <laughs> and I can hear you and I can repeat the question. Yes, she's here. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Um, I was actually curious about how you identify the sensors if it's just a wire and you have multiples of them. Are they unique okay. identifiers or you know, how difficult it is and how far away you can place them between each other? So uh, the, the output of the wire is a single maximum, very sharp, uh, with well-defined position, uh, which changes the position of the maximum, changes with the stress temperature or other properties, depending on chemical composition. There are a few ways how to distinguish the wire. Either you use multiple uh, pickup coils at different position, or you generate in homogeneous magnetic field, and uh, using multiple wires, your signal obtains multiple maxima, which are distributed all over the time. The closest wire, gives you the first maximum in time, and the farthest wire gives you the last maximum. In this way, you can combine even wires sensitive to different parameters, so using single sensing system, 
uh, you can detect temperature distribution, stress distribution. The size of the wire is comparable to the size of the nerves you have in your skin. So uh, using plenty of wire, you can get sense, sense from the composite, like keeping your hand inside the composite. How many you can place, it depends on your IT software, software specialist, how clever they are and how many wires they are able to not only detect, but to process also in real time. Just you to mean, follow just up, to sorry. Um, the footprint of the detector, how, how big do they have to be if the, you want to implement them into a mold? You mean uh, detector for the wire, yes? So, detector consists of excitation coil and reading coil. Excitation coil can be different size. Either you can make a small coil that you can put uh, quite close to the wire, or, or I can make a coil around this building and generate magnetic field, something like three Ersted at, at 100 hertz, and all the wire which are inside the building will give me a response. Sensing coil size can be different. It's not important because we are looking for the position of maxima, not in its amplitude. Means we need to design the size of the coil, typical size a few centimeters to get a, the signal from the distance of 10 centimeters. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'm going to ask a question from Thomas Schleck. Can you explain to us how UNA is using artificial intelligence to monitor and optimize composites manufacturing processes and give us kind of an idea of the projects and the kind of sensors that you're using? Yeah, so good question. Um, typically, all starts with the perfect or not the perfect with the sufficient sensor technology. So at the first step, if you want to monitor a process, you have to think about which sensor technology can you use for it. And for example, you, you gave a very good example with the Cosimo project where we used these active ultrasonic uh, sensors, for example, which we uh, developed by ourselves at the university in Augsburg. Um, and by the sensors, you can, f yeah, find out, for example, in the injection process, how the flow front develops during infu infusion or injection process. And you can also, for example, find out what's the cure state of the, of the resin or something like this. And if you have the right sensor system to, to um, get this information, then the also interesting part starts. So you probably, if, for example, with this sensor technology, you need some pre-processing, uh, because otherwise we will go only, uh, yeah, not that useful data, I would say. Um, but when you can go on with this pre-processing, you'll get really useful data, like for example, timestamps when uh, the flow front or something uh, arrives at the sensor. And using this data, you can then go on uh, training, for example, a model. Um, training a model means, of course, you, you use this data, put this in this model. It ne it's not always necessary that it is artificial intelligence at the end, but it, of course, can be uh, artificial intelligence. You just need to have a proper diagnostic model to, to do the afterward analysis. And uh, in our case, for, for Cosimo, we, we used this data, for example, for this nice animation where we can uh, really track the flow, flow front during the process. And there, uh, it's, it's interesting to have this data-based models uh, because, of course, if you have this discre discrete positions of the sensors, you not typically could only say, when does the flow front arrive at a, a certain sensor position? Um, but using all this data and um, the combination of all the sensors we used, uh, we can yeah, cleverly uh, interpolate between these sensor positions. And what you have seen uh, during the presentation, uh, we can afterwards really track the flow front uh, during infusion. And In Cosimo, you were using different materials as well. And you had odd geometries. So it could help you understand what the flow was across those materials and the geometries as well. Yeah, exactly. So the, the advantage of this technology also sensor-wise is that it's pretty, um, for, for the flow front sensing, it's pretty insensitive to the material we are using because at the end it's just uh, important that you get the material arriving at the sensor position, changing the acoustic impedance of the material in the, in the mold, and then the flow front is detected at this state. Um, a different thing is, for example, with the cure monitoring, because with the cure monitoring, uh, you don't 
you don't need the, the arrival time only, you need something from the material itself. Um, so the properties of the material cha change during curing and if it's finally cured you'll uh, drive into a saturation of the, of the uh, signal for example for the measured um, sound velocity of the, of the resin. And yeah, then artificial intelligence becomes partially uh, important uh, because you can then use something like transfer learning or different approaches where you then can uh, adapt from, from one material system to, to another one. And typically you need a lot of data for this. Um, uh, the advantage in, in the Cosimo project was that we not only used the experimental data but we are already also uh, able to use uh, simulated data uh, partially from flow from simulations but also kinetic uh, models for the for the curing process or the polymerization process process and thereby we were able to, to yeah generate some good uh, models and finally something like a digital twin as we as we have seen of the infusion process of itself. Um, we're doing this not only for the injection process of course and there are of course um, several different other um, interesting manufacturing processes. For example in my research group we are also uh, investigating the, the monitoring of uh, milling processes and something like this. Uh, they are mainly based on um, on the structure-borne noise uh, signature during processing. Um, so you do something like hearing in the process and you can determine if the part quality drifts or if uh, the machining tool, for example, wears down and you can use some uh, predictive maintenance um, and strategies, for example, to have the tool always in the right state. And these are just a few examples. Uh, we, of course, also in the AI production networks are not only active as, as the chair where I am working at. We have collaboration with the uh, German Aerospace Center and also with the Fraunhofer Institute in, in Augsburg and also uh, some, uh, yeah, several uh, chairs at the University of Augsburg are involved, so we come from the um, in the, uh, from the mechanical engineering branch, but also from computer science and so on. And therefore we have a very yeah, bright spectrum uh, where we can prove a lot of, of concepts and this also in an industrial um, uh, size because we're also um, building um, a big hall, so an industrial hall with around about 5,000 square meters okay. where we have um, several different uh, machines and processes which we can investigate and yeah this is where we would want to push the limits for for uh, application of AI in the in the industrial um, processing and the goal is a smart process <laughs> exactly the, the goal is a, pro a smart process as smart as possible yeah. <laughs> it starts with monitoring and it ends with the closed loop and uh, self adapting process of course thank you are there any questions on on anything that Thomas presented. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, Nikos, can you explain the difference between your conventional cure monitoring and the cure simulator? Thank you, Ginger. So, um, yeah, uh, we have uh, recently um, launched the cure simulator concept uh, because uh, we are in this business for uh, almost 14 years. Mm. Uh, initially, we thought that we can uh, convince uh, industrial um, uh, customers that they can uh, just uh, make a hole in, in their mold or they can uh, make all the, some preparations and then they can introduce our sensors. Uh, of course, uh, th there are some applications, there are some processes that uh, uh, they accept to do it, but uh, there are some other processes that uh, they really find it very uh, difficult, like uh, autoclave uh, curing, uh, like uh, bond line uh, curing, that uh, it's, it's really challenging to um, modify the molds, modify the, the prepreg, uh, modify the autoclave. So we thought that uh, it would be convenient uh, for some applications uh, to let to, to to bring the cure monitoring, the process monitoring outside of the autoclave, outside of the bond line, and uh, just uh, use uh, some uh, only the temperature sensing in the process, 
and have everything else outside uh, of the autoclave, for example. Or introduce just a, a temperature sensor in the bond line and make all the, uh, the, curing, uh, the cure monitoring uh, away from, uh, from, uh, from production. And uh, that's why we thought uh, that by developing this, uh, this concept, the cure simulator, uh, we can just replicate in real time accurately the temperature uh, in the mold, in the autoclave, and uh, make, reproduce the curing uh, with a cure simulator. And in this case, uh, our customers can really take advantage of uh, our um, unique uh, and uh, proprietary uh, technology about the online TG and the online viscosity without having the problems of modifying either, either the mold or the autoclave uh, or uh, affecting, uh, let's say, the, the bonding uh, process by introducing uh, large sensors uh, there. Uh, so uh, we believe that uh, we can, uh, in this case, we can uh, make it easier for our customers to uh, um, take up our, our technology and really use it in, uh, in, in, in have also big benefits for them. I know you've used the cure simulator with prepreg. Have you, is it also possible with a liquid process? Uh, yes, you can use it with prepregs, you can use it uh, with, uh, with liquid uh, resin uh, or even with pastes. Okay. For, for, uh, for adhesive bonding. Okay. Do we have any questions in the audience about the cure simulator or the dielectric sensors? Okay. I'm going to ask a question from um, Eli Wood. Uh, one of the main issues with fiber optic sensors has been the installation. Uh, and I know we wrote about um, what you've been doing with that. Can you talk to us more about how you're making fiber optic sensors more practical, more usable? Yes. Um, I, we are in the field uh, already about 10 years. Um, and uh, in the beginning, I did my PhD uh, before I created the company. And we solved uh, embedding fiber optics by putting them manually. Uh, we used tubing, we used uh, tapes to close off tubings. Mm -hmm. And in matter of fact, in most of the cases, if you do testing or process monitoring, you can still use these very simple techniques. Yeah. You just have to do it right. Uh, but once you want to have a real uh, connector or a connectorized uh, system or a smart plate or a smart uh, pressure vessel, you need to take a step uh, further. Um, and for that, there are technologies available, um, uh, also based on connectors. Yeah? You can embed connectors inside panels. This is possible. Uh, but once you go uh, just for the fiber uh, without any uh, connector on it and trim panels or, uh, or have surface connectors directly on the, on the surface of, uh, of like a pressure vessel in the, in, the, in, the, in the final windings, you need different technologies. And, um, uh, already a few years ago, uh, I think it was four years ago, uh, we started a small ESA project for ESA, uh, e a European Space Agency, uh, developing an edge connector technology. And uh, this edge connector technology is based on a self-written waveguide. Uh, so basically it's an, like a bonding technology, uh, but it allows you actually to trim a panel where you have a fiber embedded in one layer or several fibers in different layers. You can trim it, we can align, and we can reconnect the fiber. Um, and then we, we add a kind of drop of glue, eh, but it's not a glue, it's uh, also an optical adhesi adhesive. And we can write a core through this, uh, through this uh, drop of glue. So we make a real connection. Uh, it's not just a connection by the drop of glue, uh, and then you need to cure it. So the, this is called self-written waveguide. So it writes its own waveguide. And then you have a an, an good optical quality uh, 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 connection. Uh, but the main uh, difficulties with these kind of connectors is that you need to uh, have uh, it industrialized. Uh, you need good packaging. It needs to be thermal stable. And it needs also to be mechanical stable. And this is the next step. We want to take it further. Uh, we're also looking for uh, real applications for that. But the concept is there. It's, it's working. And on the other hand, this is edge connection technology. It will not work for, for instance, uh, pressure vessels where you have filament winding or round uh, uh, shapes. 
uh, and we have a PhD uh, at, um, at Common Sense who is now focusing on surface connection. So actually having light transmitting from fiber, not core to core, but from cladding to cladding. So put the parallel fiber on top of it and then creating also an optical signal and transmission. This is ongoing uh, research, uh, but we are, uh, I, we, are, we are believing uh, that it will work and uh, this is the next step. Uh, so we are continuously trying to improve this, uh, basically because we want to go in the end to steady production of, uh, of automated uh, uh, panels, automated parts, composite parts, and we believe this is a game-changing technology uh, to make that happen. Yeah? Having embedded optical fibers which prove uh, their, 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 their potential yeah, of measuring strain, measuring infusion process, uh, residual strains, but also end-of-life uh, measurements of life cycle monitoring. Uh, and without this connection technology, it would be very difficult. Uh, so, yeah. so theoretically, if you have a fiber optic with the FPG sensors along that fiber optic line, and that's been filament wound into that vessel, then you could um, receive that data while it's being made, while it's being proof tested, and then again do its life cycle, say every time that cylinder is refilled. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are uh, several stages. Eh? So the stages you mentioned uh, are possible. So you also showed a nice, uh, so two, two graphs of during filament winding. This is possible only when using rotary joints. Eh? So we, we use fiber optic rotary joints uh, put uh, in the clamp. Eh? We have a, a tool for that, to do that in filament winding machines or, or also for robots. Uh, we are developing that. Um, that it's possible to measure during filament winding. This is not based on the edge connector technology. Uh, this is based on, on a real filament, uh, on a real optical uh, connection with a, with a cable, but it's possible. We do that uh, uh, every day. Uh, later, you can use the same connection uh, to measure during curing, uh, also in fiber op uh, also with a rotary joint, because you need to rotate uh, a pressure vessel while curing, yes, uh, definitely for, uh, for uh, wet winding. Um, and the same sensors you can use in the end for cyclic testing or, uh, or, 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 or burst testing. Uh, or for real uh, in-service uh, use uh, for refueling, as you mentioned yourself, uh, uh, to, to get info on the, uh, the material properties uh, as function of pressure and as function of cycles. And, and at the various layers as well. Yeah, we have been doing testing uh, for inner layers, mid layers, outer layers, hoop layers, helical layers, and it's really nice to see how a vessel behaves. Uh, and it's uh, also, uh, I, sometimes it's, uh, it's not like you think it will uh, behave. Uh, so a way to validate designs, perhaps, and yeah. optimize designs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any questions about fiber optic sensors, about know, what they can do uh, in composites? Great. We have one in the back. Oh, still not. Okay, hi. Thank you everyone for uh, the presentations. And I had a question about uh, fibers and sensors for fibers. So you were talking about BRAG and FPGs. Do you also look for Riley technologies for fibers detection? Say, say again, wireless technology? Uh, Riley. Ah, uh, Riley, Riley yeah. scattering. Riley. Yes. Uh, yeah, we've, um, so as common sense, um, we've been uh, participating in uh, several uh, uh, Horizon 2020 or uh, uh, interregional projects. We've also been, have been evaluating other uh, optical technologies, eh, optical fiber technologies, um, and they all have some, some advantage and disadvantages. And, uh, and we've been uh, evaluating also o OFDR technologies eh, so, uh, and also relay scattering. But it's not, uh, not all, all the time usable, uh, definitely if you go to higher frequencies. Eh? Uh, or uh, if, if a fiber breaks, if you need fiber loops. So there are uh, several uh, things we've been testing. Uh, but we believe actually the, the FBG technology, and definitely if you go uh, to smaller uh, scale, and eh? not large scale or long lengths, FBG technology is, a, is, is one with the less compromises eh? that you have to make. So uh, yeah. We, I've been working with railing scattering as well, yes. Okay, the question was especially for uh, very harsh conditions like cryogenic conditions. Mm. Yeah. Uh, where it is more sensitive at very low temperatures. 
Yes, I, I know. Uh, it depends on what you want to measure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lots of things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. It's possible. Yeah. Are there any more questions on the fiber optic sensors? Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, so we have a question from our friend here in the live chat. Uh, who is asking uh, Thomas, so he's saying, uh, with respect to the diagnosis and uh, prognosis of uh, including uh, sensors with the manufacturing, uh, what sort of parameters do you consider to be uh, stochastic in nature? All right, I didn't get the last part, sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, what sort of parameters do you consider to be stochastic in nature? So for, for the injection process, which, which parameter we, we use to, to monitor? Or yes, that's it. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's differently for different technologies. So if you want to, to monitor the flow front itself, um, then what we are doing is um, we are measuring the, the amplitude uh, of, the, of the acoustic uh, signal we are getting back. So we're sending an, an acoustic signal uh, within the tooling, and then at the, at the boundary between tooling and the workpiece itself, um, the signal gets, gets reflected. And what we are measuring is the amplitude of the reflected signal. Um, if the flow front um, arrives at the sensor position, then the acoustic impedance changes because uh, at the first step you have something like an, an air gap uh, because the, um, the preform is, is can be seen as, as air boundary uh, to the to the tooling and if the reason uh, um, gets to the sensor position you will get um, higher impedance there and therefore the, the reflection coefficient changes and this is why um, less signal gets uh, gets reflected and we will then see an, an very good visible drop of the signal amplitude, and uh, if you see this this drop, uh, you can determine it by a yeah a certain th threshold um, where the position at uh, the flow front needs to be arrived there. You can then say okay, the arrival time is reached there. This is this for the flow front for the um, for the curing simulation. You can different ways. You can do it also in in pulse e echo. Um, measurement and then it's nearly the same pr uh, principle because also um, the, the, the uh, resin changes its properties uh, during curing and, and thereby um, also the reflected uh, signal changes so if it gets harder uh, during curing um, the it more and more signal gets gets reflected and therefore you can can observe this uh, the other way to measure it is you can also uh, measure it in a transmission uh, mode so you piece uh, you put two sensors uh, one on the other side uh, on the one side one on the other side and you send the pulse through the material and then for example you can measure the the sound the velocity of sound during uh, dur uh, which the, the signal has during passing uh, the, the preform and the curing resin and thereby if it, um, it it will increase constantly and at a certain point you get into saturation and if you are in saturation you will get to a point where you can say the, the resin is cured. Other thing is also damping effects and something like this with, which also changes during infusion process. And yeah, these are the, the, the main properties we are looking at uh, at this technology. And combining all these technologies, you can can have uh, yeah, huge um, information uh, package which tells you a lot about the injection process it, itself. And that I was all using the ultrasonic sensor. Sorry. That all of that was using the ultrasonic sensor. Yeah, exactly. This is only the ultrasonic sensors, but we also have a lot of other sensors in the system itself. So and then you compared. You can all compare it. You can uh, validate. Do a data fusion of everything, and this is also when then uh, AI, for example, becomes uh, very important because it's at this point you get huge data um, uh, composition, and then it's often gets complicated to have a good insight <laughs> into everything. And then uh, machine learning, for example, can help where, where, the, um, yeah, where you, you lose the, the overview of everything and the, the connection between data implications. Great. Are there any further questions? OK, I'm going to, oh, great, we have another one. Yeah. 
Hello. Okay. This is Diego Vidal from LMM Queen Power. A uh, question about these uh, fiber optic sensors is uh, how do you see the application of these sensors in large uh, composite structures, uh, more than 100 meters, in an intensive uh, labor uh, environment, especially with these uh, uh, some fragile sensors, uh, if they can be um, handled or uh, probably a different uh, application or different uh, sensors in this kind of uh, environment? Yeah, uh, that's a good one. Um, and most of the time get the, the, the criticism that uh, fiber optics are expensive and fiber optics are fragile. Uh, and uh, in, in, real, in reality, it's uh, totally not the case. So, um, for instance, on price level, a uh, break-even point is already at eight uh, sensing points. Uh, if you talk about large structures, you would like to have more sensing points. Uh, fiber optics can go up to uh, uh, 20 sensing points per fiber for FBG. Uh, then, then it's convenient, then you can go to large, large strain variants uh, and strain ranges. And to talk about fragility, it's all about how you embed it and how you handle it uh, during production. Uh, and later on, cabling, etc. this is actually a piece, of, a piece of cake, definitely for big structures. Uh. Um, if you talk about windmill blades, you use mats of 100 grams, 500 grams, or 1,000 grams. Uh, uh, we can use also different types of coating for the optical fiber. And then that fiber can a little bit, uh, be a little bit thicker. Uh, we can uh, pull through it, for instance, GFRP coating around it, and then it will be uh, uh, less fragile than a, a just uh, a fiber. We also use this in concrete, uh, concrete pouring, so uh, it's, it's made for harsh environment. Um, and for large structures, it's possible to uh, semi-distribute FBG sensors uh, along the fiber. You can use one centimeter uh, dis interdistance up to tens of meters. Uh, so it's, it's uh, possible to make a network of, the, of, uh, of sensors. Okay, thanks for the answer and the second question. In case uh, that structure needs to be uh, repaired and the sensor is affected in the, in the area, how would you see that connection between the, the uh, uh, optical fiber infused with the laminate and the prepared optical fiber. Yeah, that's a, a good point. Um, in most of the projects, we uh, use both sides of the optical fiber. Uh, so we go in and we go out. Uh, and if there is a breakage somewhere, you don't lose the sensors. You can recombine uh, using multiplexing technology. Yeah. But repairing in the laminate, that's more difficult, of course. Yeah. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask a question of Tuli Patella at Colo. Can you hold up the color probe that you have with you? And can you explain how a material supplier or parts fabricator would work with you to use your sensor technologies? Um, maybe give some examples of some of the companies you've worked with already. Thank you, Ginger. So this is one of our probes, one of our sensors that we have. So our color liquid analyzers were designed as a comprehensive process control system. So we have two models currently, this immersible probe and a color plate that is installed into a pipe or tank via an inlet. So they're measuring the process in the process, in the process line, in real time and continuously, sending direct feedback into our cloud user interface. And thanks to the EMF technology, we have vast capabilities of what we can do because we can detect nearly any change in liquids uh, from phase changes to chemical composition changes, such as degassing, agglomeration, polymerization, homogenization, and crystallization, for instance. To name a few, there's so many we can do. Um, so combining the EMF technology with our advanced signal processing algorithms and the real-time and continuous data that we receive, we can actually m measure the state of the process in real time in the process, which gives us a lot of op opportunities for process control, process optimization, and product development. So we saw um, a graph of the paint manufacturing earlier, where we were measuring the entire paint manufacturing process where in each they add ingredients one by one and they have their own reaction before they can add the other one, the next one into it. So they have to finish that one reaction. And they've been using a lot of buffer times when they use recipe-based recipe monitoring. So with our sensor, we can see exactly when the, each 
of the ingredients is installed in there and we can see when it's finished. So you're shaving off a lot of extra energy to, that you don't really need because if you're controlling your processes based on the state of the material in real time. And we can do this by monitoring different batches. So we can monitor a optimal batch where everything goes correctly and put, put that as a sort of op optimal print ideal. And then we can monitor different batches. And if you have a batch process, for instance, if we would have a resin and an additive or a hardener, and you would be mixing those up, you could see how the mixing happens between the different batches if you're doing it in batches. And that would help us help our customers to improve the evenness of the quality between patches. So they would get more even quality. So one of our customers is a Kielto, an adhesive manufacturer. So they use our sensors in several different steps in their production chain, actually. So they're using it for product development, where they are actually measuring the resin and hardener and the degree of the hardening to optimize different glues that are drying faster or slower and with different properties to see they have a, that they have a larger drying time or shorter open time when the adhesive is still able to work with. So they can get these new products out much more faster than with traditional methods because they're using our sensor. So the second thing that they do is that they actually give their, their customers our sensors and their customers are monitoring the actual drying process of the adhesive as they are applying it in real time. And we can, we can actually, with our machine learning models, from the beginning of the curve, we can estimate the open time for when they can still apply the adhesive and the actual drying time, like when it has dried. So they don't have to be constantly going to check, like, has it dried? But we can actually tell them that it's going to be dried then, and that's when it is. So that reduces a lot of scrap from failed, failed adhesive processes. So then, but that's not all, because Kieldo actually gets the data from how their customers are using their adhesives through our sensor, which they can then bring into their product development again to optimize their products to become the ones that have the kind of properties that their customers actually would need and want. So it creates this loop between product development and optimizing process performance. I know that you had spoken to some of the companies here about using the sensors in RTM and looking at the mixture of the resin through infusion or RTM. So that's a different kind of application. Uh, yes, uh, we've uh, measured a two-component resin before with ABB. We've been uh, measuring the viscosity and monitoring it in real time mm -hmm. to monitor low viscosity, high viscosity, and the actual levels because they're using big tanks full of the mixture, and they have to ensure that it doesn't go too high and it doesn't go too low. And if it goes too high, they have to throw away the entire, the entire tank, which is a lot for the environment. Uh, so we are controlling their viscosity in real time with that, and we are actually not measuring the um, mechanical viscosity. But we have been able, with our eight pro proprietary features, to link their, vis their reading to uh, rheological viscosity. So <laughs> that, <the steam. laughs> So we are measuring it with the rheological viscosity. So we're not at that. Yeah, we're going to have to close right. for today. Yeah. Let me do one more ask. Is there any questions on what uh, Colo can do? OK, great. Oh, yeah, one question. And then I think we'll have to end. <laughs> Hello. My name is Marcel Schumacher. Um, I was wondering, um, you said you're in process measuring. And there's a cavity, a mold, a form, and the measurement thing, the sensor, has it an impact on the form, or is it just to do some trials? And then after that, 
to do the parameters in process? So um, our EMF field doesn't affect the liquid at all. So it just set, projects the field into the liquid and it just sees the charges of the electrons and how they are interacting with each other. And we can extract different parameters from those and analyze those and connect those to understandable and actionable parameters. Because if you're measuring something in real time, well, if you get cryptic parameters that you don't really, that you have to now then think about, okay, what do we need to do and analyze how you, what, what do you need to do to actually now affect the process or affect the measurement, it's, it's not really utilizing all the benefits of the real-time measurements. So we actually are linking the measurements that we get into actionable parameters. So when you get the measurement results, you actually know what you should be doing now to control the process. But we can also be used in laboratory to optimize different products. OK, so more like trials and then find out the parameters, and after that, use the parameters in process. We, with our machine learning models, we can actually start, it can self-taught itself to see, for instance, quality deviations when they're marked and start alerting when the quality is going out of specs. OK, thank you. So thank you so much, all of you, for being here. I would encourage you all to interact with our companies. Um, our panelists here and the companies, uh, most of them are also on the floor in the exhibit area. And um, yeah, contact them after the show and learn more. Thank you so much. <laughs>